Hello everyone and welcome to this new episode of Tech Pizza, the podcast, video series and newsletter where we try to make tech more like pizza, easy to understand, democratic and fun. If you are watching this video or listening to the podcast and you're not subscribed to the newsletter, I highly recommend that you do so that you can get links, you can get descriptions, you can get much more in your inbox for free. So go and subscribe on tech.pizza. I'm back from 10 days of dog sitting my family's Labrador in Rome. It was crazy. The dog has way Way too much energy and I'm very happy to be able to film this in my studio because this episode is mostly about AI which as you guys know it's my main thing it's my favorite technology is what I'm an expert in we're going to be talking about Google's DeepMind lab that open source the protein structure of 200 million proteins we're going to try to understand what the hell that means then we're going to talk about AI algorithms that push the price for Bruce Springsteen tickets up to $5,000, why and how? And then last but not least, we're gonna talk about AI impersonating a philosopher, which is a little bit of a controversial news that I really care about. So let's get started. DeepMind's AI just released the protein structure for every known protein. And this could have a lot of potential outcomes on the research, on new drugs, on diseases, on new foods, on energy, on a lot of different things. But let's try to understand really what happened. And first we need to talk about proteins. What are proteins? Most people, when they hear about proteins, they think about meat, they think about eggs, they think about protein shakes. That's true, these are all proteins, but proteins are much more. Proteins are basically the building blocks of life. So proteins, based on their structure, they can regulate basically every biological process from you gaining weight, from you losing weight, from your diseases, from all of your functions, as well as everything else that happens in biology. So they're really important. Now, proteins are made of amino acidic chains. What does it mean? Imagine amino acids as basically like legal blocks. That's, I'm not a biologist, but that's how I understood this, and I think it's a pretty simple model. These legal blocks can be put together, but then they all have, imagine, some little magnets. What does it mean? It means that once you link them together, they attract themselves and they end up forming very complex shapes, where basically there's an equilibrium of all the different forces that keep these amino acidic chains together. Now, based on these very complex shapes, these proteins can link and can attach to different parts of your cell, different parts of your body, and what that means means is that they end up having different functions based on the shape. In the past, when researchers needed to find out the shape of a protein based on its amino acid sequence, well, that was a process that took a lot of time. It took months. It took years. They had to do it in a lab running a bunch of different experiments. A year ago, DeepMind, which is Google's AI research lab, released an AI model called AlphaFold. This model was capable of, given just an amino acid sequence, they were able to understand how it was going to fold in all the complex structures that it could possibly assume. So now, what happened last week? Because AlphaFold is a year old, roughly, right? So what happened last week was that DeepMind realized that this model, even though it was open source and so everybody could use it, was not super easy to use. You needed to have a lot of competences in artificial intelligence and computer science. And so they decided to take all the known proteins, run them through their model themselves, and then just publish their results. This means that for every researcher from now on, they can basically just, almost like a Google query, they can just go and find the protein they're interested in, and they're gonna be able to use and see what's the structure of this protein calculated by DeepMind's AI. This is gonna make super easy for any researcher to work with these proteins. And once again, they are the building blocks of biology, which means that it's gonna speed up research in a lot of different fields, from medicine, to nutrition, to even energy, etc, etc. So, pretty cool. Bruce Springsteen started selling tickets for his 2023 tour, and the prices went up to $5,000. But if that happens, we don't need to blame Bruce. We need to blame algorithms. Let's try to understand what happened. So Bruce Springsteen started selling his tickets through Ticketmaster, which is a platform that you probably know. You can buy tickets, basically. And they decided to use something called Dynamic 
pricing. Dynamic pricing basically means that you don't have a set price for whatever you want to sell, but you let algorithms figure out the optimal price so that you have a lot of people buying it, but they pay as much as they can, basically. So you can maximize your revenues. Now, you already used dynamic pricing. You used it every time you shopped on Amazon, even if you were maybe not aware of it, but maybe in the context of flight tickets, you know, the prices go up and down. It's because they have algorithms that do dynamic pricing. Their algorithms try to find the maximum price they can propose to fill the plane. And you, maybe you're used to that kind of setting, but it's pretty rare that these things are used when you want to sell tickets for a concert, even though 40% of overall e-commerce uses this technology. Why I think, and a lot of people think, that in this case, it's a little bit unethical to use dynamic pricing. Because, well, think about what these algorithms do. These algorithms try to understand demand, and if there's a lot of demand, they pump the price up. But what happens when you try to sell a ticket for a concert? The dynamic of this phenomenon is that a lot of people go and buy the ticket at the same time, which is the perfect or worst case, depending on which side of the table you're sitting on, for algorithms to pump the price up. That's exactly what happened in this case. Now, to be fair, Ticketmaster said that they did not use dynamic pricing on all the tickets, but just on a small part, just on 11% of the tickets. And the average price that they sold the tickets for is $262, which is not crazy for an artist like Bruce Springsteen. Ticketmaster says that it didn't impact a lot of people, but a lot of people were kind of pissed looking at tickets that were up to $5,000. Now, this is kind of a weird case, I believe, because from a certain point of view, you may think that dynamic pricing doesn't do anything more than just find the optimal price. Optimal for who? Optimal, obviously, for the artist. Optimal for the company that is reselling the tickets. And people may end up getting screwed. But if you think about what happens usually in concerts, is that, well, there are scalpers. So people who buy tickets for cheap and then resell them for maybe the same prices that you would have paid in this case with the dynamic pricing. But in with dynamic pricing, the artist is getting the money. So you may argue that it's better. Kind of a strange situation to think about, but I think what we need to learn from this case is to really think about how algorithms in a specific situation may have a completely different impact than in another one. AI impersonated a famous philosopher fooling even experts. Let's try to understand what happened. This was an experiment done by three philosophers. They wanted to see whether people were capable of understanding whether a text was produced by the famous philosopher Dennett, an American philosopher who researched consciousness and a bunch of other things. He's an interesting guy. Go check him out if you don't know him. Or by an algorithm. So this is what they did. They took 10 questions and they asked these questions to the philosopher, to Dennett, who produced an answer. And then they asked GPT-3, the most powerful AI language model we have available, to do the same. Then they picked four answers from GPT-3 and one from the philosophers, and they asked different kinds of people to identify which one was the correct answer. If you had to choose by chance, you will have one out of five options to be right. So anything better than one out of five means that you actually were able to understand who was the philosopher and who was AI. And normal people, people like me and you, unless you are a PhD in philosophy, the case, cool, congrats, were barely better than chance. They were right 1.2 times out of five. So basically the AI was almost, really almost as good as the philosopher in generating these answers and people were not able to discern. Now, if you ask the same thing to philosophers, to people who had a PhD in philosophy, or even they asked to friends of Dennett, they were selected by himself, well, they obviously were much better, but still, they were right with 5 out of 10 times. So, still not great. So, what does this say about AI? First of all, this was not a Turing test. People were not allowed to interact with the technology, otherwise, especially the philosophers, they would have probably easily realize that we're talking to a robot. So that's not a full-blown Turing test, but it still says that AI is good enough for people to not be able to understand if they're talking to an algorithm or to a human being, or if they're reading, in this case, maybe it's more accurate to say it this way, if they're reading content that was produced by an AI or by a person. Now, 
this is a big problem because science shows, and we've seen it a few weeks ago on Tech Pizza, that if an AI behaves like a human, people think that it's a human. People think that they are talking to a sentient being. And that creates a lot of different problems. I've been pretty vocal about it. I think this is a big problem that we don't know how to solve, but we should find a solution for. And so there was another very interesting case, I believe. Tell me what you think. <laughs> Thank you for watching this episode of Tech Pizza. And once again, if you're not subscribed to the newsletter, I think you should, because then you're going to get all this news right in your inbox. Subscribe at tech.pizza. And I'm going to talk to you again next week. Ciao.